So the unknown, the mysterious, is where art and science meet. So the unknown, the mysterious, is where art and science meet. Albert Einstein once said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. So the unknown, the mysterious, is where art and science meet. Infinite Imaginarium presents Peering into a parallel universe and patterns of consciousness with artist Micah Hofstadter. Okay, you're listening to the Infinite Imaginarium podcast. I'm your host, Meg Boardman, and with me today I've got Satori D. Are you there, Satori? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, what's up? <laughs> and we also have a, a special guest on today, Micah Ofsterdal, who, from what I've seen, is a bit of a master of creating some really wonderful art, which kind of shows all the intricate details and patterns that appear in our reality, sort of in nature and plants and anatomy, and cleverly combines it with a, a kind of surreal element. And if you want to go and check out some of his artwork, you need to go to www.micahofstadal.com and check out this exquisite artwork. So welcome, Micah. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Well, thanks for joining us in the Imaginarium. Kind of my first question for you is what sparked you initially to begin the journey of sort of creating such wonderful paintings and with such intricate detail and, you know, that everything that you've got going on in a painting, it's sort of like, I had a look at a couple of your paintings and I had to keep zooming in and I kept seeing more and more stuff in it and it seems, it was just so incredibly detailed. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I mean, I look back a lot in, in over my life and, and try to see where this is all coming from and I can pinpoint a lot of things. Um, one big moment was when I actually started painting again about eight or nine years ago and uh, I was looking for inspiration and came across an anatomy book, uh, Gray's Anatomy, and it was just full of fairly simple illustrations, um, just black and white, not overly detailed of, you know, anatomy and um, I was particularly drawn to the images that weren't very recognizable. Oftentimes they were microscopic or very detailed um, cross sections, you know, really zooming in on the anatomy, like to the cellular, cellular level. And just started painting for fun. I didn't really have much intentions or ideas at the time. And, and just started taking bits and pieces and, and from that anatomy book and laying them on the canvas. And, and like I said, these images that I was using were fairly simple and just black and white and I found that that is the perfect source of inspiration for me doesn't where rather than using like microscopic photography with color and everything and it's, it's almost too much information so anyway that was that was definitely a starting point and ever since then I've been um, painting these sort of so it started with anatomy like I said um, and since then I've branched off into other biological forms for my sources of inspiration um, and just kind of using bits and pieces and putting them oftentimes into a, sort of a landscape format and putting a surreal twist to it. Yeah, there's um, there's definitely a bit of a flavor of uh, the Dali in there. You know, when you just glance at it just very quickly, there's sort of that, it kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the things that he's done. Just when I literally scan over uh, some of your work, but then obviously when I go into it in a detail, it's actually not anything like Salvador Dali at all. It's a lot, it's a lot more technical um, in a sense, whereas his tended to be more blended together in, in many ways. He sort of had a surreal element, but then it'd be all blended in and, and merged together. But with yours, you kind of like zoom in, and there's just so much incredible detail. I mean, do you spend, can you spend a lot of time on one painting or, you know, how many hours would you spend on a, on a painting? Have you, is it something that you will just spend hours and hours and hours getting every single little detail, you know, at a cellular level? 
making yeah. sure you recreate that on the canvas. Yeah, so I mean, every once in a while, I do sort of try to keep track of my hours just out of curiosity and see what sort of pace I'm on. Um, and like, for example, I think an 18 by 24 painting that's inches um, took me 80 or 90 hours. And that usually, that would probably be like a month or maybe two, depending on how often I can get into the studio. So I usually keep track of it in that sense of how long it took me over weeks or months. And that, like I said, kind of depends on how often I get in the studio, but an average painting does take me probably a month or two. So I, I really only get about six or seven paintings done over the course of a year, but I did start painting some, some smaller pieces just to have a little wider range. But, um, but yeah, like you mentioned Salvador Dali, and I think that was a good way to put it, um, that at first glance, it's very Dali-esque. And that's what a, a lot of people will say. That's definitely the first name that gets thrown around when people first see my work is, is Salvador Dali, um, partially because he's probably the most well-known, but also, I mean, there are definitely those similarities, but yeah, the subject matter is, is very different for sure. And I do remember being influenced by Salvador Dali when I first came across his work. I think I was in high school um, and I was just kind of blown away and was like, yeah, wow, that's that's definitely, I don't know, it just, it just connected with me. So it was like already on that wavelength. So there's definitely several moments throughout my life. You know, I mentioned coming across that anatomy book when I actually started doing this style of painting. I got back into painting. But I look back at several other moments well before that, even from childhood, I was probably four years old or so coloring in coloring books. And I remember asking my parents for the whiteout when I would go outside of the lines in my coloring book. And so there's, I can even look back at that and kind of laugh a little bit for one thing, but also um, see sort of where my perfectionism comes from. And even now I'm, I still have that. And I, at least now I'm creating my own lines in my paintings, but uh, I do have this tendency to want to really sort of go for perfection when creating those lines. What are your kind of main sources of inspiration, you know, when you start a new project or a new piece of artwork? Right, well, um, yeah, so beyond that, that Grey's Anatomy book, um, I've, like I mentioned, I'm kind of going into other forms of biology and nature as well, and in fact, don't use anatomy a whole lot in recent paintings. Um, so like Ernest Heckel, for example, is a great source of inspiration to me. He was a sort of scientist slash more of an illustrator, um, scientific illustrator, um, mid late 1800s. And there are books out of his work. Um, one in particular that I use quite a bit is called Art Forms in Nature. And it's kind of similar to like that Gray's Anatomy book where I mentioned it has like black and white drawings um they're detailed but they're also kind of simplified in a way and his work is just really beautiful the way he does it but it's just full of so many biological forms and patterns and sometimes i don't even know what i'm looking at but and that's not even really the point um, because i'm not a scientific illustrator um, it's just a good place for me to start and get some sort of like patterns or lines and shapes and textures and whatnot just for a starting point um, and sort of a visual inspiration and I'll just take bits and pieces of that and kind of well first I'll, I'll start laying them down very quickly in a sketchbook and don't spend a whole lot of time on my sketches it's just to get sort of a general composition and the su subject matter in there and then I'll start painting and that often changes throughout that process. But, and other sources of inspiration would just be actual nature. I try to get out as much as possible. And that's definitely my biggest inspiration. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's not always a direct inspiration where I'll actually look at something and put that into a painting, but it's just inspiring to, you know, to me as a person and to my soul and, and just energizes me. And I'm always in awe by it, you know, even just looking at the a simple leaf, you know, and looking at the vein structure in a leaf or uh, looking at a flower really closely, especially even just like a tiny flower that you might not think is anything very special, but then you look closely at it and it's, you know, if that flower was, say, four inches wide, 
it you know would be one of the more popular flowers out there because it's just so beautiful but you would easily pass by but just because it's tiny and i'm always just blown away by by nature and you know no matter how much time i spend on the painting i could never even come close to what's going on inside of you know even just a blade of grass because if you think about you just looking at a blade of grass it's not much but the deeper you go into it and think about you know down to the cellular level and how it functions and how it grows and reproduces and goes through this whole life process and just think about how complex it really is even though it looks so very simple on the surface and at our level just if you were to look at it you wouldn't think twice but um, so I'm always just blown away by that and that goes into my work and I think that's partially why I put, try to put so much detail into my work is to, to draw the viewer in more and more and to appreciate looking closer at things and being drawn in and um, you know there's like different levels to it hopefully you can enjoy it from afar but you know go in closer and closer and you'll find more and so that's um, you know another thing I think about is sort of infinity even infinitely small or infinitely large for that matter space is just kind of all relative um, or size is all relative so all those things go into my work and that's kind of where that surreal aspect comes from is because there is so much mystery to life as well even that simple blade of grass might seem simple but you know it's, it's really so very complex yeah it brings something to mind actually that a lot of um, artists struggle with and something that we all kind of have to learn and I know that as an artist myself I struggle with this a lot and it's kind of when you it's that point when you think right that painting's done I'm not going to do any more to it and obviously we all have different styles of, of the way we do our artwork and different sources of inspiration but that was one of the things I'd like to ask you because your your artwork is so detailed you know that's the, the a big part of what you do it's the detail at what point do you sort of say to yourself, right, I'm, I've finished now? I've... Yeah, and that can be tricky. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I do these do some sketches, and that lays out the general idea of where I'm going with it. But oftentimes that changes along the way, and oftentimes I find that it needs a little bit more. And I think partially because I'm usually painting quite a bit larger than my sketch, and so when you put it on that larger canvas, it just needs more to it. But it, so sometimes it's when I get everything on the sketch and I, I kind of know what my end goal is. Um, other times, like I said, then I, I find that I need more and then I just, so I'll just keep adding a little bit here and there until I think, okay, that's it's done. And, and yeah, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Sometimes you, I guess you just know when it's done. I try not to actually overcomplicate my paintings too much, despite the detail. I put a lot of time into sort of perfecting what's there but at the same time, try not to put too much into it. So if you're looking at my website, for example, and if you picture that as like a you know, larger painting, on one hand, some paintings, you might think there's not even a whole lot going on. But again, if you look closer, you'll see more detail. And it, I just don't want to like overcrowd the paintings too much. And so just rather than doing that, I sort of go for perfecting what's there. On the other hand, some of my paintings do have a lot going on, but I guess that's all relative. But yeah, so I don't know. You just kind of know when it's done. And sometimes you just can't spend any more time on it and you just have to be done with it. But And thankfully, it's not infinite as far as, you know, like I mentioned, like actual nature is infinite. Like you can look at the human body and keep going in further down to the cells, down to the molecules down into the atoms and, and go on forever and the quarks and what makes up quarks. And it's like, we may, we may not even know what's beyond that because we cannot see that yet. Thankfully with painting, I, I can only go so far and I don't bring out the magnifying glass or anything to get, you know, and that's kind of where I draw the line. I, I even try to sometimes catch myself zooming in way too much on the canvas when I'm just a few inches away and I'm thinking, no one's ever going to see this. So just back off a few more inches and don't worry so much about that fine of detail because you're kind of just wasting your time. So um, I try to draw the line somewhere with, with that. And of course, everything you know, you... Is, um, 
perception of the world around them. They have their own kind of mind map, as I call it, which determines what their perception of their external reality actually is. And this is the whole thing with art, is that people see different things. And I've sort of created, been halfway through creating something and somebody's come to my house and they've seen it and they've gone, oh my God, I love that. And I'm, I'm, I say, yeah, but it's not finished yet. It's going to change next week, it'll be different. And they're going, no, don't change it. It's fi-. To them, it's finished. To me, I'm still working on it. And uh, sometimes I'm frustrated because I can't get to a certain point of where I want it to be. Somebody comes around and views it and they, to them, their perception is telling them that it's a completed piece of work. And they're saying to me, why, why would you even want to do anything more to that? It's, it's, it's perfect the way it is. And I'm thinking, no, it's just not finished yet. And I've also done pieces of work where I've completely ignored my intuition of, you know, like you rightly you said, you sometimes just get a feeling, you know. I've sometimes ignored that feeling and I've gone on and then I've kind of, in my view, in my perception, I've destroyed a piece of work. And I've quite often, I've created things and I've just completely whitewashed the whole thing and started again. I, so I think sometimes I should listen to those people when they come around and say, actually, that is finished. That looks really good. And I'm going, no, no, it needs more detail. It, it needs to. Um, so it's a strange thing, but I would definitely agree with you in the sense that you, you do just get a feeling and you just know when something's finished and you don't want to add any more detail. That was why I was interested. But the, the next thing that I was going to say was that, you know, in terms of the artwork that you do, it really kind of highlights the the connectedness of our reality. Um, you know, like, for example, with the human eye, when you kind of zoom into that, it takes on a look of nebulas and things like that in space. It's got a very similar look to it. Um, and I find that so many things in our reality that have these kind of patterns, there's obviously something there that connects everyone, everything together, because mm-hmm. there seems to be these repeated patterns in things. Um, you know, like there's elements of a tree when you when you cut through a, tr- a, a tree and you look at sort of the inside of a log or something, it has certain patterns and similar things to the human anatomy, um, to the human being and, you know, fruits, flowers, um, all the things that we find in our reality all have some kind of connection. So I think it's very interesting, that, you know, the art that you do, because it really highlights that connection that we have in our reality that I'm not sure everybody is aware of or thinks about. It's not, it's, you know, I've mentioned this to people before and they've never, never really sort of, some people just look at you blankly and they don't really know what you're talking about. So I was just wondering in relation to your art, how you view the reality that we live in. Well, yeah, I'm, thank you. I'm glad you get that from looking at my work too. Um, that's something that's kind of, come along over the years uh, when I started painting it wasn't necessarily something I had in mind but that's something that I have noticed developing in my work as well and sometimes I feel like I am just another viewer of my work because I don't often go in with the concept in mind ahead of time I just start doing and often look back at it and continue to learn about it even paintings I did years ago I start to see patterns and things and so yes that connection to nature and other patterns in nature, not just connection of humans to the rest of the nature, but all the connections throughout nature um, and seeing the patterns and um, similarities, uh, because we do have to remember that we are part of nature and sometimes we view ourselves as being very separate from nature. And I see where that comes from, because in some ways we are very unique species and do a lot of things differently than than any other species but and so that's definitely part of what my work is about is that connection to nature but sometimes i do throw in that separation from nature too every once in a while you'll see more man-made looking structures in my work but yes going back to like some of the patterns in nature uh like the branching pattern or networking pattern is, is something i've found that appears in my work quite a bit um, and you see that at so many different levels um, in trees obviously but not just the trunk to the branches but then down to the, the leaves and the veins and the leaves and it keeps going and like the word fractals comes to mind there but also you see that same pattern in, in the veins and capillaries of us and other animals um, you see that pattern in rivers and streams and there's something 
not just do you see that pattern, but there's also something very symbolic about the pattern too, because it's it's always carrying something. There's like a, there's a source and it's in whatever's in that, whether it's the blood and the veins or the water in the rivers or the, the water and, and nutrients um, flowing through a plant. Um, it's it's like giving life. It is life. It's um, so it's obviously a very important part of life, and and so that plays a symbolic role um, in many ways in my work. And that's just one one of the patterns that you'll see in nature. And the more I do this, the more I see those connections, and it does kind of bring me closer you know, to the, to the natural world. I think your art is very significant at the time you know the time we're living through at the moment because everything in society and it has been for sort of hundreds of years is so divisive um you know yeah. subsequently everything that we are taught everything that we, everything that we're sort of uh, programmed to believe is the right way of existing in life becomes quite divisive and there becomes a lot of kind of labels and groups you know whether it's religion or class system um, and yet you look at reality the reality that we actually exist in and it's completely connected and not divisive at all and as i said before it surprises me how many people i've, I've sort of said this to a few people i've said have you ever noticed uh, you know this pattern in in nature or you know the pattern in this shell you know or whatever and then it's very similar to the pattern an area part, a part of the human anatomy and and a lot of people which i find quite surprising have never thought about it that it's never occurred to them they've never noticed these connections and i think the great thing about your artwork is that people who are not consciously aware just looking at your artwork would have a very profound effect on their subconscious mind and it would help to expand their consciousness and their level of awareness and that was one of the reasons why I was so interested to get you on the show, because I felt that, you know, I, I haven't come across an artist in recent times that has such an amazing way of creating something that would that would benefit people just by looking at it. I think all artwork is beneficial for people to just to look at it, you know, it, it's it mm. because we connect with it, you know, our brains connect with whatever the artist was feeling at the time, you know, it's the, that empathetic resonance thing, you know, when you look at artwork and immediately allows you to connect with the essence of what the, the artist was feeling or experiencing when they were painting that, that picture. And so I, mm. I feel like your artwork is amazing in that respect. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, Go ahead. Just to kind of like touch on that, because this is something too that I got from your your paintings and also to i love when um even in, in my own experience of the experience of viewing your art i i see these connections of whatever i'm kind of like reading or thinking at the time and i was reading this article and it was at the, of this other artist and he says when he was talking about his role as an artist he thinks that the role of the artist throughout history is to remind people of what life is about because people tend to forget everything and we get in these situations of our humdrum life and we, and how bad the planet is and people start to live in this, this kind of how, which is like this uh, detachment from nature. And that, you know, what you were saying about you just walking out in nature and, and seeing that blade of grass or whatever. Um, not too long ago, I had this experience of, uh, I had like something in my eye that was like bugging me. And then, so I went into the bathroom and then I was trying to get the thing out of the eyes, but then I, st after I, I stopped focusing on, I think it was like an eyelash in my eye and I got it out of my eye. And then I started to focus in on my actual eye. And I was like, oh shit, look at all the, the whole geometric patterns of it. And then I could see a slight reflection of myself in it and how it goes that infinite of that loop, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it kind of reminds me of this scene that I liked when I was little and you watch uh, Men in Black and it has, I think it's the closing scene of a galaxy and it's all in this like marble and i think that's something you know what like good art or whatever we we tend to forget and that uh what you're saying like you you kind of like view your own artwork and i the more i talk to different artists everybody has this similar experience and i, I phrase it because i do more more poetry i said that i i have this experience that i'm just the pin that like I'm the one like viewing myself doing it third person. And I think, whoa, that's kind of cool. Like in those little grooves, 
and you might not even fully realize it yet but like later like you said you look at it and and you see that connection and this this whole kind of fractal nature of of everything and i think those moments is what like life is all about life is all about like this uh this infinite beauty that is in every single moment of our awareness and that we kind of like forget because you know we we have bills to pay and um different things that alert us and pin us and ping us throughout different things uh so it's just something that i kind of wanted to throw out there and and express of my own experience of your artwork but also connecting to my own thing that i'm always kind of playing with or mulling over in my own head you know my view is that um it's just kind of creating that new yeah you know, again as well people are scared there's, there's a lot of people who are very creative and have a lot of uh, to offer the world and various gifts that they have but they're too scared to express them because they're worried that people might not like it or they'll end up with having a lot of negative critique on their work you know whether they're a musician or an artist painter artist or you know they create music or they sing or they're a writer there is something very that puts you in a very vulnerable position because you're kind of bearing your soul when you create a yeah. piece of artwork you're bet it's kind of the essence of who you, who you are and you're then showing the, the world you're showing the people so that would be kind of my view on on the whole thing i just feel that all artists i have a huge amount of respect for them because i think what they do is is very brave in in a way that they would reveal i mean a lot of people say well why would you even be worried about revealing it it's it's brilliant but it's not necessarily the feeling of the person who's created that artwork somebody might really like your artwork and yeah you know, it's so subjective and another person would absolutely hate it so it's very difficult to know what the response is going to be and i think there's a lot of people still out there that haven't revealed themselves in that way or they haven't shared that part of themselves yet well yeah like you said it's um it's definitely revealing something about yourself to to everybody who comes across it so there is that vulnerability to it and depending again kind of what what sort of artwork you're doing or like you said it could be music or or any form of art. Uh yeah, I think you just have to get over that and not worry about it <laughs> for one thing. Um and like you said going back to like uh, creating the new neural pathways or going down new roads. I mean literally when I take the back roads using that analogy literally is when I find discover new things, a new trail to hike on or a lake or something that you know new gems and oftentimes have the most fun rather than just doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, it, it's definitely a case of stepping out of your comfort zone and I think that makes me think of another thing as well that there's this whole negative thing that surrounds people who suffer from depression and obviously a lot of artists suffer from depression um or they're bipolar or there's some kind of issue there and I think again depression is an opportunity for people to become introspective and i think people that get depressed are sort of on the verge of looking at themselves in a much more introspective way you know it may be that something has triggered it so they have a major life changing event or some kind of a trauma that triggers the depression and what usually happens when somebody suffers a severe trauma is it literally strips them down to sort of the bare bones essence of who they are um it takes away all the labels and identity that they once knew and then they have to suddenly look at themselves a lot more closely sort of look they're looking right into the mirror and and seeing who they really are and the awful thing is people feel the need to suppress that and they think it's a bad thing and that depression mm-hmm. needs to be treated with some kind of medicine from the doctor you know antidepressant things like that and i actually think it's a it's a process that should be explored which sounds a bit strange why would anybody want to go deep and deeper into their depression but i think it's misjudged for what it actually is i think it's something that all human beings go through at some point because it's a point where you become more connected with who you are as a person 
And a lot of people find that scary because if it's a new experience for them, that they've never suffered depression before, that it feels scary because they suddenly start, you know, along with what is described as depression, they start to notice things a lot more about their reality and about themselves. And I think a lot of people find that quite scary. And I find that just doing art, um, creating art, I've had to, certain pieces of artwork that I've created, I've had to go into some really strange realms of my brain in order to create that work and create that artwork. And some of those things have, have been quite dark. Some of those places I've had to go to have been quite dark. And I think me and Dan did a show actually quite a while back now, all about the dark night of the soul and that whole thing about going into the those darker realms or looking at things in a different light which can be quite frightening but if you go through kind of the pain barrier of that things become a lot easier you know you lose the yeah. fear of, of, of failure the fear of something going wrong the fear of uh, people laughing at you or you know for what you believe in it kind of liberates you so you have to kind of travel to that dark place in order to be liberated and come out on top if that makes sense you come out yeah. feeling better and you don't yeah. feel the need to conceal yourself anymore you don't feel the need to be something other than who you really are because it's through fear of losing your social status or people thinking you're weird or whatever but unfortunately there has to be that pain barrier and that's the same as you know like i was saying you have to go into new realms you have to visit new places that you would never have thought of visiting before that would normally be so i think that's what's brilliant about art and yours in particular because it yours your artwork in particular highlights that connectivity in, in all things yes thank you and yeah our, our reality is certainly like not just what we experience but it's it's how we react to what we experience so like you were kind of saying we, we sort of create our own reality and our reality is is all like our memories and and everything we've ever experienced and not, but not just that we experienced but how we experienced that experience or in other words like how, how we dealt with that experience or reacted to it and so you are in control of that or at least you can try to be as much as possible i you can't necessarily control what happens to you but you can control how you react to it and learn from it and even the negative experiences, like you're talking about earlier, you know, you can let those go and move on from it. And you, but you can also use those to, to your advantage. Um, I mean, you don't want them to bog you down, but if you can learn from them and move on and say, you know, oh, I don't want to go back there or this is how I want to react to this negative thing and sort of turn it into a positive and like you we meant talking about depression. Um, I think I'm not a depressed person. I don't have like clinical depression or anything. I, no, I mean, I've never been tested for anything like that, but I feel like I have been depressed at times, um, gone through. And I think the worst part about that is not really knowing why you're depressed. There's no, like nothing happened, nothing bad happened to me. So why do I feel bad? And, and that, and it's just all in my head and and i think that's like the worst part about depression and, and again that's me speaking for myself i don't i mean i've heard a lot of other people say the same thing but like you were saying too it's you can also you can turn that around and not view it as such a negative thing because then it just makes it worse and you just get more depressed and you're depressed about being depressed and it's like this downward spiral until you break out of it but if you can turn that into a positive and yeah, like you said, kind of welcome those dark places that you may go to. It's not that you want to be there, but try to turn that into a positive and not feel guilty about it. I, for me personally, I can usually listen to music or paint and it I might still be in that same headspace, but I feel okay about it. Like it doesn't bother me. It's harder, I think, when you have to deal with the outside reality. You know, if you have to go to work that day and you're not in a good mood or you're depressed, that's when it seems to be harder to deal with or harder to function as a person. But 
and that's the thing about art is it allows you to go to those places and just be there and to just focus on something and create and that's i feel very fortunate to be in that position i mean i, I still do work a part-time job to help you know get by in this reality and pay the bills and things but i'm cutting that down um down to two days a week but anyway so i, I even where i'm at now i feel very fortunate to be there to spend to be able to spend a lot of time creating um, and going to those places in my head. But I still think that's very important for for everybody to cre be creative somehow, in some way. Not everybody's going to paint or crochet or make music or whatever, there, but there's so many different ways to do it. And to, it's, it's a meditation in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, that that's just another way you can just meditate, but it, to be able to relax for a little while and just be you know feel connected and and just kind of forget about the daily grind sometimes because i think we get pretty easily sucked into that's our reality it is just work and television and the news and yes that's all real but it doesn't have to be everything and, and we forget that there's this world out there that we're living in <laughs> I think that's part of the problem as well, that people get depressed and they then say, I haven't got enough time to do the things that give me the most joy and the most pleasure. Um, you know, that's one of the, the, the big issues with people is that they haven't, they say, I haven't got enough time. How am I, how am I going to find, where, when am I going to find the time to do these things? You know, these creative um, projects. And I've said to people in the past, if you're feeling that depression or that lack of satisfaction with the groundhog day scenario of life which is part of what i was saying you know that's part of the leap that they're on in their brain that they've been partly in sort of indoctrinated um they created a, a a looped program in their brain so they go round and round in circles and they say i haven't got enough time i want to do x y and z but i can't find the time to do it and i just keep going round and round in circles and the same thing keeps happening over and over again and I said, well, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got to go to work the next day, you're going to be thinking, oh, God, I've got to go to bed. I can't stay up all night and read this book that's really, like, drawing me in and I'm finding it really interesting. And these are the times when people are depressed about their life and dissatisfied in some way. Um, and they're going into the dark night of the soul. They're, they're starting to have that feeling of, of, you know, I just don't like my life the way it is that's when they start to sort of notice things and you know like they might read something and it really resonates with them but then they'll suddenly think I can't stay up and carry on reading this because it's now two o'clock in the morning and I've got to go to bed and I've got to go to work tomorrow and I said but that's the time when you just have to say I don't care I'm going to read this because something inside of me is saying read this or uh, research this and I said that's all part of creating another neural pathway another road a new road when you create a new road, you will you will be able to come off that loop of Groundhog Groundhog Day, the, the repetitiveness that you feel trapped in. Because this is the feeling that people have. So many people have this feeling of being trapped. And if you say to them, well, why didn't you try this? Or do that? They say, well, I can't because I haven't got enough time or I've got to do this. Or... And I think that's where the depression stems from. The depression is almost like, you know, you've got your your lower self, your little self, which is like the ego part of, of the human. And then you've got your higher self and your higher self will create a depression because it's kind of like saying, you need to, to create a new road, a new direction. You need to create a new road um, that will ricochet you onto another path and then you will be able to stop going around in this continual loop. But the problem is because of the way people view depression as a, being a bad thing, Rather than thinking, seeing it as a positive opportunity to change things, they think, right, I'm going to medicate myself. I'm going to go to the doctor and medicate myself, and then I'm going to carry on on my usual path. Um, so then they repeat the cycle, and then they become dissatisfied. And it's like people are always looking for stuff that's external.
on themselves to make things better. They think, oh, if I just had a little bit more money, I'd, I'd feel better. Um, if I was married to a different person, I'd be better. If I didn't have that boss or that particular job, I'd be better. So they seek things outside of themselves to make things better. But then, of course, what they end up doing, because they haven't addressed the fact they're on this same continual loop, they then find themselves in another situation that's almost identical to the one they were in before. So if it was a situation with a job, they say, oh, I've got this terrible boss, I can't get on with them, I, I don't get on with any of the people in my job. They look for another job, they get a new job, and for a very small period of time, they're happy. And then all of a sudden, like they're, they're the, the most unlucky person in the whole world, all the exact same scenarios present themselves but just in the different in the form of different people or a different location different job and then they feel that they're you know really unlucky person and you know how i can't believe it i've got this new job and then the same things happened again because they haven't addressed that thing i was saying about creating a new road or doing something different but people eventually will will get it i think and they'll realize that the power of changing something comes from within. I mean, it sounds like a real cliche, you hear that kind of thing all the time, but that really is the truth. It, it comes from, you know, within the, the deep, dark recesses of your mind to change something. And, you know, everything that has ever been created in this life has come from somebody's mind, has come, it stems from a thought in somebody's brain. So, yeah, I think people have to sort of try and understand that, that it's not easy. Um, because there's so many distractions in, in life and so many things to stimulate the senses um, ricochet us into so many different directions that we don't have a clear clarity of what our part of what path we we want to travel. Um, we constantly get distracted by things in our reality, uh, usually through social media or the television, or it's very influential on the brain, and and of course that then determines what the reality is yeah um because it's kind of funny because i was mentioning this uh, before the show but kind of going on with this whole um taking a different path and like you know i guess in a, in a simple phrase is when life gives you lemons you make lemonade so i was talking about how just last week um i broke my headphones and at first i was like oh, i was a little pissed my initial reaction was like oh great that's all i needed like i have these projects that I want to do, I have to video edit uh, some Are You Serious show, and then what about Imaginarium, and then I couldn't talk to Nikki when we had the show, and then I was just like, you know, and then, but the, the funny thing is that, so I was uh, without my headphones, and, and then I was like, you know what, it's fine, whatever, and I started, I always read, but like, that was like my, like I couldn't do any video editing. I couldn't listen to music on, on my computer. And I was like, what do I do? And then so I like, I busted out my my uh, small little record collection and I put on some vinyl and I just sat uh, writing. And then after a while, like the next day, I was like, oh, should I get the headphones? I was like, no, I, I gotta finish reading this article. And then I had an idea to do this, to do this writing. And then I wrote like this poem Then I had this, idea for this short story and then uh, so the next day came i was like oh should i go to to go get headphones i was like you know what no i was like oh i'm gonna listen to more king crimson and i was like oh i'm gonna read this i'm gonna read that and i literally didn't buy the headphones until nikki reminded me that we had the show today and i, I, <laughs> and I bought them like probably like six hours ago and so like for more than a week i i just was like eh I just I don't need the headphones. It was it was just funny because like I just went with that mishap that happened and kind of just explored that road a little bit more and just kind of went with it. <laughs> and it all went it all worked the minute yeah. you took the path of least resistance. It's, this is the thing. This whole thing about resistance is when you resist something, you're actually kind of fueling the fire of the thing that you don't, that you want to eradicate or the obstacle that you want to overcome. You know, when you, you have that feeling of frustration and you're like, oh God, I've just got to do this. Or the minute you took the path of least resistance, it all came good for you. Uh, I think that's, that's another thing that we could talk about probably in another show, but it's, it's just that, you know, that resistance to something actually is pouring energy into the very thing that you don't want anymore. 
Yeah, definitely. Taking those negatives and, and turning them into positives again, and learning from them, and instead of thinking "poor me," you know, think about how you can, what you can do, in reaction to that. Or it's like your headphones. Sorry, it reminds me of like when the power goes out or something. You, first, you think, "Oh, what are we gonna do now?" You know, we, uh, we can't watch TV or whatnot, and so you kind of have to. You, all of a sudden, just one second you're doing one thing and the next second you have to like think of something else to do and um just kind of throws you out of your comfort zone and that's it's a small thing it's not a big deal but it um it's just sort of symbolic and it kind of forces you to maybe get a little bit creative and and go down that new path yeah definitely for sure there's there's um and it, it kind of came out of uh necessity a couple years back I'm, I'm a, a cook, so this restaurant that I helped open up, we didn't succeed, so it went down, and then, so I was out of a job, and I was like, oh, okay, I don't know, like, how long, well, I kind of was like, okay, I'm gonna use this time to kind of, like, milk it, <laughs> that was, like, part of my deep, dark secret, I was like, oh, okay, this is, like, an excuse for me to kind of, like, take a break, take a, like, a vacation, because I mean, especially opening up a restaurant, like I was there, like I literally would wake up, go to the restaurant, come back exhausted, fall asleep and repeat and repeat. And then the time that I did have a day off, it was what we call a work hangover where I was just, it was literally like a hangover and I would just sleep all day and feel really bad and then go back and do it. And then, so I was like, you know what? I was like, I have a little bit saved up. Like, but I'm gonna like take away any expenses that I don't need. And so I was like, the cell phone bill is too much. I was like, you know what? I could go without a cell phone for a while. Uh, so I canceled my cell phone and I didn't have a cell phone. Uh, and I noticed like, you know, when I would go places with people and, and just even like riding the, the bus or, or just walking around, like I didn't have this, uh, this thing to distract me easily. And I would just like overhear conversations, kind of like notice things more. It's like, oh, I kind of like this. So now I have a practice of like, anytime I'm out with like friends or, or family at dinner or, or show or event, I'm like, I'm not taking this out at all. And I, I, find, I had this dream once where I was walking around and it was like this old school arcade. And you know, like uh, this video game used to be Cruising USA and, and things like that were these kind of like these uh, simulation games. But so in the dream, that everybody was like tied in, like like VR, VR goggles into this machine. And I was like trying to wake people up. I had this dream like uh, in college. So it was like seven years ago or whatever, but it always sticks in my mind. And so now I still have this like same feeling, not all the time, but you know, I mean, I remember, you know, going to uh, with my family, my my parents uh, like baseball and, and I used to play baseball when I was younger. So we'll go to a, the Dodger game. And I just like noticed that like everybody seems so glued to their phone. And I would just kind of like walk around and, it, and I felt had the same eerie feeling that I had in that dream. It's just something that I found that it worked for me, you know, and it helped me to like stop and smell the roses and of course you have to have a balance like you were saying you know there's actually you know uh, necessity survival stuff that you need to do but uh the thing that you're doing when you're procrastinating is probably the thing that you should be doing as like you're calling for your life you know like if it's like doodling while you're like waiting in a line or is it that you you take little notes or is it that you like you know playing video games or that you like you know really really watching a movie and you like analyze the scenes or is it music and it's sh i don't think there's any reason why you know what stops us from from let's say exploring these different parts of ourselves is is just that mental block of well i need like oh i got work in the morning i got this <laughs> i remember one time i told my friend he calls me up hey i got some acid I was like, oh, okay, cool. But uh, uh, that was the time that um, I was actually um, trying to start up this this uh, catering business. And I was like, I don't know. I, I got work in the morning. He's like, it's not, you know, I was like, I know I've done acid before. I, like, I could physically do it, but mentally I wouldn't want to do it. Like, I'm going to like un unlock 
the mysteries of the world and then I'm gonna have to like chop vegetables the next day like I could physically do it but I'm not gonna want to I'm like I'm gonna walk out and like yell at my chef that life's too, <laughs> too short to do this mundane stuff and he just started laughing we ended up doing acid that night I didn't quit my job that day but it was just funny because that's like the thought that came into my head it's like I'm not gonna want to do it <laughs> it's like sometimes you have you know, you may be with a, a group of people um, and you're all having this great conversation. I remember this one time, well, this, this sort of thing used to happen all the time, actually, in my family. You know, me and my sister would be getting into this really great chat and my mum would come along and she'd be like, right, you've got to go to bed now, you've got to go to school tomorrow, blah, blah, And we'd be having this really amazing chat and we'd be like, no, 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 but we just need to finish this conversation. Um, and she'd sort of try and break it up. She'd no, no, you've got to go. And quite often the linear part of the brain you know the organized part of the brain will take over and sort of try and say no you need to be disciplined you need to stop this now and i kind of think sometimes you need to ignore that if something feels right at the time you know there's kind of some there's a there's a internal spark of energy to continue with something but there's a part of your brain saying no you need to stop this now you need to do such and such because you're going to be tired in the morning a bit like the thing with with what you were talking about Dan with taking the acid I think if something's right if you have that feeling of internal spark everything will work out so for example if you were staying up late and you were having a discussion you would still go to work the next day and feel strangely okay it'd be some kind of miracle but you'd be like really weird I stayed up all night having that amazing conversation which has created that new road in my brain that new neural pathway yeah I feel perfectly fine I think everything works out everything happens for a reason so if, if, if you're it connected with that feeling when something's right and when you have to continue with something then I would my advice would be to continue with it to carry on and then all external things and other things that have to happen will just happen. Will be fine, and you'll be you'll actually say to yourself, "That's really strange." I, you know, I stayed up all night, but yet the next day I just got up for work and I was absolutely fine. In fact, I felt really energized and brilliant because you went with the, the flow of energy, you know, rather than trying to go against it. And I think that's kind of the rule of thumb with people that they they try and control things too much because of of the system and how they should do things. And if things come up in your life naturally and it feel, you know, your, your logical brain is telling you that it's not really going to fit in with the schedule, just ignore it and just go with the flow. And then you'll find that it just kind of works out really well. It, it all, ha you know, everything happens for a reason, I guess. That's, that's kind of what, that's the thought that springs to mind. But listen, guys, we're kind of coming up to the hour now. So we're going to have to sort of wrap things up. And uh, just to sort of come to an end, i just like to go around and speak to people and sort of get their final thoughts on, on everything we've sort of talked about today on the show. So I would start with you, Dan. Um, you know, final thoughts on our discussion tonight. Oops. Uh, well, I guess just my, my final thoughts are to... Um... Let yourself uh, wander and, and wonder about the world. And I think that's something that comes through when I see uh, Micah's work is that you kind of like sit there and you're like, like, for instance, the mind's eye, right? One of your one of your paintings. And it, and in it, it has it, what, what to me is like the spark of the, the synapse, which is like also this kind of symbol of a sun that's like in the middle. But it also too has that fractal nature of like the firing off of, of stars and the galaxy and just just like the experience that I had when I told you when I was doing something mundane as getting something out of my eye and then I stopped and like looked at my actual iris and noticed the geometric patterns of it but also to notice this reflection of myself and just got lost in that simple wonder of of the now of, of nature of this moment of time that we have of life and, and to dance and play with it. Um, since, since I'm more of a poet than I am a visual artist, um, I call them the songs of eternity, dancing to the heartbeat of the universe. And it's hard at times, but I think 
you know, it's it's funny because it's it's one of those things that it's both hard, but it's also easy. You, once you do it just a little bit, you figure like, well, I could, I mean, it's like nothing to to just sit down and be with yourself. Like when I said when I lost those headphones, to kind of just like be in silence in my room and be alone with my thoughts and just follow every little crazy spark of an idea down the rabbit hole of the spiral nature of this fractal connection to my experiences, to to different things and letting it like render in my mind and, and, and see that play out within my own self and then see it kind of get reflected back to me as doing this show, um, all this, these other side projects that I'm doing with um, Are You Serious and Mondo 2000. And it's just crazy that if, how far it, uh, you could go with it. And I think, you know, this, this ride of life, it's about enjoying yourself, learning a little bit about yourself, um, the more you learn about yourself, the more I think um, the world kind of opens up to you and you and you get those little moments of seeing how everything's in, in this elegant dance, um, dancing to the songs of eternity, to the heartbeat of the universe. And yeah, that's it, about it for me. So, Micah, do you have any uh, final thoughts on sort of everything we've talked about tonight? Well, yeah, and I have to agree with both of you. Um, you know, like um, you're saying, to wander and wonder as we walk through this world and sort of getting lost in the small things, you know, like looking at your eyeball. I mean, I've definitely been there where you just kind of get lost for a moment um, and enjoying the detail of your iris or... Um, looking at the veins in a, in a leaf when you hold it up to the sunlight or um, maybe there's a little drop of a little water on that leaf and it's um, and you can zoom in a little bit and, and stare at the reflections and how it distorts um, everything that's being reflected in it um, and I could go on and on and on and it's a big part of what my artwork is about is kind of looking at things under a different light, um, arranging them in maybe a, a different way. And also to begin with, just putting things on the canvas that you wouldn't normally see in the first place, um, maybe because it is microscopic or maybe because it's sort of beneath the surface. Um, you know, it could be like a single cell radiolarian. Um, if you're not familiar with those, just Google radiolarian and you'll be amazed. It's just it's a microscopic organism in the ocean. It's at the bottom of the food chain, um, but it has this amazing geometric structure to it. And I didn't know about them until after I'd started painting. And this was probably seven or so years ago. I should say painting in this style that I'm doing now. But and was looking for inspiration at the bookstore and uh, my wife uh, who's my girlfriend at the time but came across this this Ernest Heckel book on radiolarians and and it just blew my mind and I was just like what that's a that's, those are real things you know and they're very geometric um, detailed structures and it's just amazing to think that all that can go into something that you couldn't even see with your naked eye and that's Again, just one example, and I'm continually being um, amazed by what's out there. Um, and that's one thing I love about what I'm doing is that not only do I just enjoy painting, but I enjoy this, the other side of it and just looking sort of the research um, and sort of using the other side of the brain and, and, and it helps me, it motivates me to, to look for inspirational things not just for visual inspiration for my work but just inspirational to life um and i just can go deeper and deeper into that but it enjoying those things as you walk through life um i just feel is really important and it gives you a different perspective on life it makes it more interesting simply put 
and it allows you to think beyond that reality that's just immediately in front of us you know in the daily routine like we've been talking about even if you are stuck in that daily routine at least you can enjoy some of the small things along the way so yeah i hope i don't you know i'm glad when people look at my work and some of that comes across because i just do my work and like i said sometimes i'm like the viewer and i can learn things from it myself but when someone else can get something out of it like that it gives me great pleasure and, and makes me feel like what i'm doing is actually uh, worth something and not just a selfish indulgent thing that I do just because I like to do it. Um, my goal is to go beyond just doing it because I enjoy it and you know I feel like I'm good at it and it feels like my my calling or something like that. Um, ultimately the point as what I think it should be with anybody and what how they live their life is how can I spread some of this to other people and how can I try to make the world a little bit of a better or more interesting place maybe open a few minds or whatnot so uh, thank you for noticing some of those things in my work yeah and I would say that you know everything is kind of a remix um, you know what we we look at the things that other people do um, you know such as your artwork Micah we can look at that and then we it will trigger something in us um, <clears throat> fellow artists fellow people in general we can then create something new I think to be honest with you every single artist that has ever lived has derived some inspiration from somebody or something so you could argue that they that their creation is some form or some aspect of somebody else's creation but what happens is and this is the great thing and this also highlights you know this whole theme of, of connectivity that we've been talking about in reality, how everything's connected and how there's patterns in everything, um, you know, these, these very clear similarities of connection, is that when you look at somebody else's artwork and you experience that empathetic resonance, you then create something that's new. You create a new creation because you've been inspired by somebody else. And obviously this is the, the beauty of, of art and, and being able to share our artwork with other people is that we trigger something in somebody else. And obviously everything about the reality that we live in is, is art in itself. You know, we derive inspiration from everything that we see and everything we experience. So in that respect, you could say that, that everybody's artwork and everything that anybody has ever done or created or invented even is some form of plagiarization. So I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing that, that people are constantly building and creating the new from things that they see in their reality and things that they derive some kind of inspiration from. So yeah, I would say that, that your artwork is great in that respect because it, it not only is it, you know, all artwork is, is, is something that we can derive inspiration from. But your artwork in particular, Micah, is, is highlighting that very key aspect of how we're all connected and how everything in this reality is connected. So, yeah, I'd like to thank you for, for coming on the show. But no, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. And, um, and we will create a remix of this show. So, you know, stay tuned for that because it should be good. And thank you, Dan, as well for for being here okay. yes thank you both for, for having me my yes. pleasure and um yeah but yeah like i said stay tuned and uh we'll create something magnificent out of this and 